Good afternoon. So our next speaker is Mark Rees. He's been programming for over 30 years and started using Python at 1.4. So his um, talk today is called Seeing with Python. Please welcome Mark. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm on from the same vintage as uh, Peter. I don't have a punch card story. My punch cards were the ones where you put the pencil on when I went to high school. Uh, and uh, I've got the glorious title of uh, CTO, so I don't program much anymore. Um, so my Python now is what I do in my uh, spare time, so I can keep my hand in. And uh, this, this talk is more about a problem I wanted to solve at home. Uh, but interestingly, uh, a couple of things have come out of it that mean uh, I'll be able to actually use it for work. Okay, so. Okay, when, when I started putting this talk together, I started to think about what did I know about computer vision, and I'd forgotten that a long time ago, um, and it's condensed up because of the resolution of the screen, uh, a long time ago I did some computer vision in another job. And back then it was called machine vision. So this was 1984, and cameras were things that cost five or $6,000, and they had parallel cables, and you talk directly to the uh, charge coupled device. And you had to write everything in assembler, and you basically move the image from the camera to memory, and another microprocessor took over and handled that image while you took the next uh, shot. And all your development was done on computers like Vaxes and things like that, and then you get all your algorithms done, and then you would put it down onto uh, a microprocessor and debug madly. And why did I do this? Uh, I work for a company that graded fruit. Okay, So we weighed fruit normally, but uh, the big trend was we needed to size fruit using a camera. And this fruit would go past at 100 cups per minute, and then that's what you did when you weighed it. When you wanted to go optical, you basically flicked these kiwi fruit down uh, the lanes at a speed that if you stood at the end of it, you'd probably die. And so you had to take all these pictures. So I, I, I had six months of that. Then never did anything else with computer vision. And then comes along now, and I thought I'd better look up what computer vision is now, and it's a lot more complex. Um, but in the end, all we're talking about is we are taking an image, okay? But what we tend to do with computer vision now, what you think of computer vision, especially with uh, NSA surveillance and things like that, is all about this real-time identifying who you are, are you a terrorist, things like that. There's cameras everywhere. I mean, supposedly London is the most um, photographed city in the world. They don't have police on the beat anymore. They have them all looking at the cameras. And then you've got people like Google trying to uh, have automated driving, so they've got cameras and stuff on like that. But in the end, as I say, all it is is we are taking an image and we have to process that image. So my reality in computer vision is last year I bought a NinjaBot. Like so um, Kickstarter project out of uh, Sydney, Australia. Uh, it's a ARM processor board with an Adreno on it, and you get all these cool sensors. I was going to build a burger alarm. Only problem it turned out was I put my sensor where I wanted it by the door, and we at the time were living in a federation house that was very close to the footpath, and every shadow and sun and everything triggered off my sensor, and my phone was going off and stuff like that, and it's like, what can I do? And I thought, I'll, I'll, as only a nerd would do, I'll make it more complex and I'll put a camera there and when the sensor fires, I'll work out if it's a, a real reason for me to be worried. So I plugged in a USB camera and immediately discovered the problems of USB cameras is they're slow. Take a lot of processing power and my poor little ninja bot could not actually handle the camera and the other sensors. So all of a sudden, I'm starting going back to 1984. I need a processor for my camera. So I bought this really cool board called a, a Beagle board. 
and programmed it up. Worked quite well with the USB. It's got a one gigahertz processor in it and reasonable memory and things like that. And sort of solved my problem and did all this in Python, which is what this talk's about. And then decided, oh, but what about if I put a sensor out the back and stuff? And these are very hard boards to get hold of. Quite reasonably priced, not, not as cheap as a Raspberry Pi, but very hard to get hold of. You sort of put your name in and you get surprised if one ends up coming to you in the mail. So I decided, well, I'll go for a commodity computer. And so I bought a Raspberry Pi. And the really cool thing about a Raspberry Pi, it has a camera module. And guess what? It's parallel, and you move the bits. And so here I am, 2014, back in 1984. <laughs> and it's quite cool. My 10-year-old son built me the camera map. Um, and you know, it, basically, if I want to expand this, it's relatively cheap to do it. So anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll go through my, my journey uh, using Python. Now, this is based on a talk I gave in, at PyCon Singapore, which I had a lot more time. <laughs> so um, I've got all my slides, but I may go racing past. I am also doing live demos. And based on what everybody else has been doing live demos, I am really silly. <laughs> but we'll give it a go. OK, so the, the most important thing to understand about computer vision, it's more about more than just taking the image. There's lots and lots of things in it, and the biggest one is lighting, which is probably why all my demos will fail. But it's doing things about picking the right algorithm for the tasks that you want to do, having the right sensor, there's a whole lot of different cameras. Do you have a camera that has the infrared filter on? Do you have a camera that doesn't have the infrared filter on? Um, you know, how am I... How am I going to handle the image when I get it? Do I want to do things in real time? All the things like that. So it's, it's more than going, I've got this camera. Oh, look, it displays on my screen. Computer vision is going to be easy. If you look at it as I have to take an image at a time and do something to the image, you make it a lot easier for yourself. As soon as you start talking about real time stuff, it becomes very hard. So if you're here to design the latest uh, Ro autonomous robot, you're in the wrong uh, talk. Okay, I'm, I'm here about processing images. But if you want to know about the tools that you might be able to use this, I might have a few. Okay, so we'll, we'll start with the original Python image processing. Okay, so the Python imaging library, it's been there forever, um, or ever since I've been using Python. Uh, developed by a person who did a lot of image processing for uh, weather and things like that. So um, for a long time, it wasn't even, you didn't even get the source. You just The binaries came. If you paid the money to him, you got the latest version, and I think you got the source. If you didn't pay the money, there was this little installer, and it installed. And it's happily followed Python along until, I believe, he went to work for Google. And then it stopped. You could never install it with pip or um, set up tools. And so what actually happened is uh, some people have picked it up and there's the fork of it, which is called Pillow, and that has continued to be developed and it runs all the latest versions of Python. But it doesn't really matter. It depends on your distribution. Sometimes you'll have um, pills, sometimes you'll have Pillow. Um, but it just works. So this is where it gets interesting. OK, so I'm, one of the things I will say, when you're doing things like where you've got to use all these libraries and stuff, you get a lot of dependency hell. Um, so I, I would recommend getting one of the scientific distributions. So I'm using Anaconda. Um, it was the first one I downloaded. It began with A, so it worked. Um, so you can see I'm running a, a actually a, a, a slightly out-of-date version of, um, of Pill. But as I said, in the end, it doesn't matter whether you've got uh, your, it's photographs you've been taking on your handphone or it's things you are taking with a, with a video camera. In the end, it's a frame, it's an image, so you can use this to do it. And so we'll do the selfie, and 
So we can manipulate the image. And the quite nice thing you can convert. So if you ever need to do some conversion, you can you can do it with um, Python. Um, the other other thing is, in a lot of computer vision, you don't need to worry about color. So if you think about it, an image with color is quite a large hunk of memory that you've got to process. So one of the first things you'll do is you'll convert it to grayscale. And again, this is where you can use the other libraries to do it. All the other ones I talk about, some of them have it, some don't. So you can sort of link the libraries together. You can do some nice things with it. We can um, copy and paste regions. You can do your sizing and rotating and things like that. So even if you don't ever see yourself doing things with video feeds and stuff like that, in your Python toolbox, you've got some really cool image processing stuff. And um, I don't think you'll quite get auto awesome, but you know you, you can do stuff. And sometimes there's things you want to do which the tool that you have is not, not going to quite do it the way, way you hope. Um, another one is in the SciPy package. Um, they've got a, uh, a module which basically is for handing n-dimensional arrays. Okay? And this is where we go from pill, which is basically giving, it has its own representation of an image and it manipulates it, to when you are starting to use NumPy. Okay, so again, because you need to do a lot of mass, basically being able to use an array is a, is a good thing. Now, because I know, as I said, this was based on a bigger talk, I'm going to run out of time, so I'll just um, cruise through a lot of these things. Um, but what, on the last slide on this, there's a link to a Mercurial repository where all these notebooks are. So even though it says PyCon Singapore, it is exactly the same thing I was showing for um, PyCon AU. Um, yeah, so in some respects, it's a little bit like pull, you can load an image, you can save it. Because it's um, an NumPy array, you can modify it with NumPy. You can get some nice statistical information. Um, you can do all your transforms. The only thing I will say, because I'm, I'm using IPython here, is when you display the images in the IPython notebook, uh, it's expecting it in a different format than what most of the things when they're dealing with NumPy are. So further down here, you'll see a little function which will convert it to more natural color. Um, still works, but it gets quite weird when you start seeing these oranges where you thought it was green and things like that. So, as I said, in, in SciPy, there's a lot of stuff you can do. You could probably do a lot of what's in Pill. It's really what you're more comfortable with. Um, this is one that I um, only just discovered, and so I, I have no demos. Um, but basically what uh, this guy has done is a lot of the things... He, he wrote this around about the same time as um, SciPy's uh, n-dimensional library was being written. It's all written in C++. Um, he has quite a good, if you go to his website, a paragraph that explains why he feels it's better than what some of the other ones are offering. But the quite cool thing about most of the Python modules for doing computer vision, they implement lots of algorithms. All right? And so he has quite a wide, wide range. There's um, over 150 of them. And again, this is one of the things you'll discover as I found myself reading lots of academic papers just trying to work out how these algorithms work. Because as I said, computer vision is more than taking the photograph. It's about identifying the algorithm and then working out why it doesn't work. <laughs> so you have to learn about it. Uh, but the nice thing is a lot of these algorithms and the Python wrap, because they're Python wrappers on C or C++ code, are actually quite fast. So Python, you're not suffering the, you know, the dreaded stigma of we're using a scripting language. Uh, this is a book uh, that I bought early in my um, study. What, what's quite nice about this, it, it goes through uh, a whole lot of scenarios about doing images, doing panoramas. I was, as Graham will tell you, I've been battling with trying to get a panorama of the Brisbane riverfront working. Um, <laughs> I should have stuck with my slides uh, with ones from Singapore. Um, 
but it's all about feature detection. He explains feature detection really well and goes through with it in pure Python code. So if in the end, with, with what I wanted to achieve, it was all about feature detection. So for me, it was a good way of learning and a good way of playing with things. The interesting thing is everything he has in this book, which you sort of read as him building up the set of tools, he's basically created a library called PCV. And so in it, there are various feature detectors and things. As necessary, he'll hook down into wrappers of other things, or he'll call a command line tool or something like that to do it. But the good thing is most of the computation from a learning perspective is in Python, so you can actually tweak it. Okay, so this is probably what most of you thought I was gonna talk about. Um, so we've gone from the things that are handling the, um, the simple images, and this still handles simple images, but it also can handle a camera out of the box, okay, because that's one of the interesting issues you have, cross-platform portability of cameras. So uh, it uses the Pi game camera uh, interface, and a lot of people have had lots of good luck with this. I had a lot of problems with this. Um, it was a dependency nightmare for me. And that's not simple CV's fault, that's Pygame's fault. <coughs> Sorry. But it was. Um, so basically, uh, when I tried to do things in IPython, even though they said that it could, it didn't work very well. But they, they have a shell, and um, it does actually work relatively okay. And pretty well anything you'll see when they say they can do it, if you do it in the shell, it will work. If you try and do it in IPython, which is, I, it's sort of at this point in time, it had become my IDE for doing computer vision because the feedback is really good when you see the images display and things like that. Um, I, I found it a little bit um, hard to work. So then I moved on to OpenCV. Okay, so uh, the OpenCV has been around for as almost as long as I've been programming from what I can see. Um, originally it was an Intel project and pretty well all languages out there have some sort of wrap around OpenCV. Again, it's just a whole lot of algorithms that have, that academia has identified as good things for doing computer vision. And Symbol CV uses part of it and has some of its own, own things and there are a lot of OpenCV wrappers. So the one that I'm using is, is the official one that comes with it. There's also the thing to watch out for, especially when you're searching on Google. There are two namespaces, CV and CV2. All right? CV2 is the one that is closest to the current version of the OpenCV that's being developed. It's got two APIs in it. One that they're sort of saying will exist, but they're not really doing any more work on it. And the new one, which is what the CV2 one is. CV is more Pythonic. CV2 is much closer to the C API, which actually makes it easier when you're reading some of the C code to actually convert it to your Python code. So again, because it's dealing with images, we can read and write images. do that. We can capture a video file, save it to another file so you can do later processing on it. We have complete control of the camera, okay? So it basically knows about USB cameras. Um, if you've got two plugged in, it'll know that there's two. Uh, so you can basically control the camera from within Python. And Again, but in the end, what you're doing is you're taking that frame, <laughs> you process that frame, you decide to skip 29, you take the next frame, and you do things like that, okay? Let me go back. So basically what, what I've got, because in the end, what my problem was is I needed to identify a human being. And so I started with the face detection stuff because it just seemed easy. Um, and of course it falls over because Mark doesn't push the right thing. 
So the, what's really nice about OpenCV is there's a thing called Haas Classifier, which is what, what the standard sort of first time you ever go to do um, face recognition, that's what you do. And there's all this training material and you have to train it and stuff. Well, the really nice thing is they have these nice little uh, training files and you get them for different things. Faces, profiles, the human body, top part of the body, bottom part of the body, identify a nose, identify an ear. Um, and again, I, because I'm running out of time, I won't, won't demo the thing, but basically what we can see with this image here is because I was running the facial recognizer, then I can get my region. I then take that region, I ask for it to identify eyes. And so this is where you can start seeing the, the uh, feature detection failing. So basically both my son and I are three-eyed. Um, but again, it, it's a, all about looking at image intensity and how the training is. But what you can do is you can then sit and do your own training for your particular uh, issue that you want to do. But it, it's quite neat when you start mucking around with these things and then you start manipulating intensities and doing stuff like that. And in Python, it's really easy to sit there, do that little change, see what the impact is, maybe change the lighting a little bit, see what the impact is. And we're, we're doing it a lot faster than the poor bugger who's programming in C. And the other thing that I, I looked at doing, uh, which there's another notebook for, is actually uh, movement detection. So I thought about replacing the IR completely. And so again, what you can do, because you're grabbing these frames, you can basically do deltas on the frames. You can decide how much the movement is, whether it was actually somebody who was walking past, or whether it was just uh, an aberration because uh, somebody walked past the footpath and the, uh, the shadow ran through. Okay, so we'll, we'll get on to the Raspberry Pi. So as I said, one of, the, one of the, you know, the first thing I discovered that when I got the Raspberry Pi was great. It's got Python on it. Even better, it's got, got OpenCV. I didn't have to work hard at all to get it to work. Plugged, did exactly the same thing that I did with the um, Beagle board. <laughs> Plugged in the USB thing. Uh, Raspberry Pi is only 700 megahertz. And... When you plug in the USB camera, it doesn't use the beautiful GPU that the Raspberry Pi has on it, so it's pretty slow. And a lot of the stuff that I'd had running well on my Beagle board just was pathetic on my Raspberry Pi. So I bought the Raspberry Pi camera, um, and it uses the GPU. Pretty cool, but it doesn't work with OpenCV. The reason for that is OpenCV is optimized on the basis that it's going to identify the cameras exactly how Linux would identify a camera, and of course, it's not USB, uh, and it doesn't, it's not plug and play. Now, there are a number of ways of doing this, all right? So there are, there's some uh, user space drivers that you can get for it. There is some C code drivers you can compile and try to get working. When I was at Singapore, I'd had a lot of problems with getting it working. The user space one never seemed to get the resolution right. Um, things like that. But what I found is there's a, a guy who's written a Python wrapper for the camera. And he uses a GPU for resizing images and things like that. And I found that, for me, that just worked beautifully. And again, because my whole mindset was get a frame, do something with the frame, I just created a class, wrapped it up, and then that's then I call my OpenCV around that. So I don't use the OpenCV commands for handling the cameras. I use the, uh, the Pi camera. But for me, it was a good fit. But again, as I said, a lot of people had Raspberry Pis said they'd had no problems with the user space one or with the, the compile one. Um, the guys put a lot, a lot of effort into it because he actually wrote it for his wife who used it on an um, industrial microscope to take pictures of bacteria. So um, you can do some pretty amazing things with it. He keeps upgrading it. So as I said, as my, um, this is what I do, do outside my day job. And I spend a lot of time traveling around Asia. So I spend a lot of time doing my development on hotel televisions in my room. <laughs> um, 
So I know every trick to get an HDMI cable in the back of a <laughs> thing. But the main thing to, to understand is it does actually work quite well. And because of the Raspberry Pi camera, and because it is quite fast, I compensate for the fact that I only have a 700 megahertz processor that I'm doing all my programming in Python and I can do the various things that I want to do. And so in the end, even though this picture doesn't show it, I did solve my problem. And then <laughs> my landlord sold the house and we um, had to move. And I didn't have the problem anymore. Um, but I've really been hooked into uh, doing things with the Raspberry Pi and, and with computer vision. So um, some resources. Both those books are really good. Okay, you've got to be a little bit careful, as I said, a lot of the open CV is about the C interface. If you use the CV2, you can pretty well translate line for line, but that's not always the best way of doing it. Where the open CV computer vision with Python was, was quite good. Um, there is one also for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, the computer vision book, as I said, was good because it allowed me to play with the algorithm of pure Python. And we'll forgive the guy at the bottom because he works for Microsoft, but that is an excellent book if you want to know more about the um, computer vision and algorithms. There's so much more. I could talk for hours about it, and it's good fun. Uh, if, you, if you go to SlideShare, look for Hexdump42, you'll be able to find the slides and um, the Bitbucket repositories there if you want to play with the uh, iPads and notepads. Thank you. Do we have any questions? On the uh, Raspberry Pi, what sort of frame rates can you process? Oh, I, I, I could get 30 per second. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and what's quite good is the um, GPU has been closed source up until about three months ago. And it started to be open up a lot more. And so in the end, they're hoping that we'll get full access to the GPU. And when, once that happens, then we'll be able to do some really amazing things with what's coming out of the camera. So the Raspberry Pi Foundation has just started to do things. So that's why the guy can do the image resize in the GPU. So they're hoping that there's going to be a Python wrapper for that soon. I think you kind of answered my question. But um, yeah, I was wondering, so Pi Camera, is obviously wrapping the, um, the everything's Pi, isn't it? Um, the Pi camera is wrapping the Pi camera Python library is wrapping the C API for the Pi camera. Yeah, because yeah. the, the problem is, is with the Raspberry Pi out of the box, all you get is these two command line routines: one to take a camera shot and one to create yeah. um, a video. The thing that I didn't mention is all cameras take a time to warm up, <laughs> and the problem is when you're making an OS system call. You never get anything when you want the photograph because it's three seconds before it actually takes the photograph. So one of the nice things about having this wrapper is you turn the camera on and then you can basically say when I want to grab the image. So because it's a charge coupled array, it has to basically warm up so you don't get the noise of it. Thank you very much. Okay.